به ومن والاه dear respected brothers and sisters before i start i just remind you that a questionnaire has been uh, distributed to you and uh, this questionnaire will help us a lot to improve uh, our future uh, courses so uh, you will help us to do this in the sense that you're uh, frank and, uh, and 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 i mean it your frank com comments and answers will help us to adjust future courses to uh, what is uh, of a great benefit uh, to the those who will join us in the future. So I do request you uh, to fill uh, this questionnaire. We made it an easy one. Uh, there is no details except the last question. If you want to add any comments, that's it. So uh, please, brothers and sisters, we need this questionnaire because uh, you will help us to improve future courses. We will allow another minute. Then we will proceed with our distinguished uh, speaker and distinguished honor guest, uh, Brother uh, Wajdi Akari. Uh, so before I introduce him, uh, now I just uh, allow time to, uh, for you to fill the questionnaire. And I see the chance while you are filling the questionnaire to remind you that our program will be as such, inshallah, God willing. We will enjoy uh, listening to an important lecture by our guest speaker, uh, Brother Wajdi, until quarter past five. At quarter 15, we will stop because uh, we have to transfer to the celebration uh, hall that has been, uh, the brothers here will guide you to the, to the place where there we will pray Maghrib and the graduation a ceremony will start followed by uh, dinner so this is uh, will be our program god willing inshallah akhali fi ahad yajma al istibana جيد أيها الإخوة والأخوات كما ذكرت لكم هذه الاستبانة تعيننا كثير على التخطيط الصحيح والمطور للدورات المقبلة فلا تبخلوا علينا بآراءكم بالنسبة للاسم optional uh, you don't have to write your names if you don't like الاسم كتابة الاسم اختياري لكي تأخذ راحتك تماما في التعبير عن ما تراه من تحسينات لهذه الدورة ولكي تعطي رأيك بكل صراحة وموضوعية بقي نصف دقيقة نجمع الاستبانة ونبدأ المحاضرة لأن لا بد أن نتوقف الساعة الخامسة والربع بإذن الله وتنتقلون إلى قاعة ليالينا لحفل التخرج وتوزيع الشهادات ثم تناول طعام العشاء Sheikh Wajdi, is it your way to paradise or your only way to paradise? Your, uh, your uh, one way to paradise, dot net. So we'll start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, 
most merciful. Dear respected brothers and sisters, time passes quickly, and this is the last session in this uh, blessed uh, course. Uh, today, uh, we are uh, honored to receive a distinguished speaker. As a matter of fact, he is the guest speaker of the course, Brother Wajdi Akkari uh, from uh, Lebanon. Uh, and if he allows me to give a short, uh, you know, uh, brief uh, biography, although, uh, you know, there is a lot of things to say about uh, this uh, brother, Jazallah Khair, who is serving Islam. But I, uh, you know, take excuse from him and from you to be brief in order to uh, allow time and not to stand between you and him in order to enjoy uh, his informative, which I am sure informative, lecture. As I said, our speaker today is Brother uh, Wajdi Akkari from Lebanon. Uh, he is at present, he is the product manager at Samsung Electronics at Jeddah. Also, he is ambitious that he is following his uh, Islamic studies and uh, he is about or maybe he has finished, this is his last semester, to get his bachelor degree in Islamic studies. But let me go back a little bit to the past and say that at the age of 18, Brother Wajdi moved to the United States where he spent uh, some time as a student. Then he joined a rap group uh, called Scums of the Earth. Uh, anyhow, it happened that all members of this rap group, they happened to be Buddhists. So unfortunately, he himself became a Buddhist. Then after that, because he's born Muslim, he didn't feel happy. He suffered and suffered for five years. Although he had a lavish life, but inside he was not happy. So what happened? He was hired at an insurance company by a Lebanese brother. And it happened that this Lebanese brother was really a good model a devout Muslim. Can we have some quietness, people, the place? Then this Lebanese brother happened to be a good Muslim, and that's why a brother, a Wajdi, he was affected by him, and they both, they used to go for Friday prayers, and uh, alhamdulillah, there was a little bit change in the life of brother Wajdi. Soon Ramadan came, and this was really a revived uh, a revival period for his soul. Ramadan came while he was in the United States, and this revived his soul. It was a big change in his life, especially that you know very well the spiritual atmosphere of Ramadan. So uh, he was lucky to meet uh, a brother uh, who studies at the Islamic uh, University in Medina, and this brother happened to be uh, spending his holiday there. So uh, brother uh, Wajdi, uh, may Allah bless him, he benefited a lot from this brother. But the, this brother, he had to go back, you know, his holiday is over, so he had to go back to Medina uh, University, uh, where brother Wajdi was introduced to Sheikh Abu Mujahid Farid. He happened to be the imam of the mosque, uh, and he's a graduate of Imam Islamic uh, University in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and again, this was a great uh, change to the best or to the better in his life. He was too much influenced by this great Imam and he started to study Aqeedah, to study Islamic traditions, Sunnah, and so on. And Alhamdulillah, he became completely different person. He started really living a real Islamic life. And he was uh, like a candle to, to, to those people in his society. He was, you know, uh, helping and spreading Islam uh, all over the place. But uh, when he had his first baby boy, uh, Mus'ab, then he has Mu'adh and Maryam, he was thinking about the future, the educational future of his children. So he made a very wise decision. 
he thought that he should emigrate to an Islamic society where uh, his two sons and his daughter will receive an Islamic education in an Islamic atmosphere. So he decided to immigrate to Saudi Arabia with his wife and with his two sons, Mus'ab, Mu'ad, and his daughter, Maryam. Alhamdulillah, he came here and he became a great credit for the uh, Da'wah Center, As-Salama Community Center in Jeddah. He, uh, alhamdulillah, benefited this center with his experience, with his fluent language, with the uh, stages that he passed through in his spiritual life. So he was a great bliss to those uh, people in Jeddah, in the Islamic Center or in As-Salama uh, Community Center in Jeddah. And uh, he uh, started, alhamdulillah, to be full-time da'ya, full-time preacher of Islam in Jeddah. And not only that, his ambitions uh, is more than that. He enrolled, as I told you in the beginning, uh, to study uh, Islamic studies and alhamdulillah, with his real zeal and uh, help from Allah, uh, he's about to finish his BA in Islamic studies. Uh, for those who would like to benefit from this great experience, I invite you and myself to visit his website uh, or his, uh, you know, uh, he has a site called onewaytoparadise.net. I'll say it again for you, so you'll write it down. One way to paradise.net. Is it one word? One way. It's just one word. You say it. You know, one way to paradise.net. I saw it myself. I enjoyed it. So I advise you to benefit from the uh, you know, numerous lectures in various topics by our guest speaker, Brother Wajdi. It is one way to paradise.net. Without any more introduction, uh, this is the time we've been waiting for. So on your behalf, I thank, and before I thank, I pray to Allah to bless Brother Wajdi and to bless his family and to bless his health and effort because he came all the way and he was continuing his trip from Medina. He moved from Jeddah to Medina and came early this morning, nearly 7 o'clock or half past 7, continuing, you know, for the sake of Allah. So on your behalf, we thank him very much. And may Allah uh, help us to benefit from his lecture and make it as a kind of guidelines for uh, our future as a da'ya to the path of Allah. Brother Wajdi, I invite you to come to the podium and benefit us from your experience. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you brothers doing? You okay? We praise Allah. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad. Okay. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsani ila yawm al-deeni wa sallam atasliman kathiran ama ba'd. We praise Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala the way he deserves to be praised. And we ask him to exalt the mention, grant peace, and send his salutations and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, upon his companions, his wives, and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. First things first. Uh, you may be familiar with this expression. Just like in, in Arabic, we have you know idiomatic expressions or proverbs. Uh, obviously, in English, we have the same thing. Uh, first things first is the concept of prioritizing. Uh, the reason why this needs to be discussed, because if you are involved in da'wah, 
you definitely have faced at some point in time a situation where you did not know where to begin or the person whom you intended to discuss a subject matter with presented you with a different subject matter which you were not ready for and that kind of put you off and therefore you just ignored the da'wah effort and hoped that someone else will continue it on your behalf. And other events of this sort where we in the da'wah field when we're trying to bring people to Islam, whether it is Muslims or non-Muslims actually, we sometimes reach this uh, crossroads and we get confused. What is it? What is the ultimate objective? What is it that I have to deliver? Where or when, excuse me, do I know that I have done my job? For us to say on Yawm Al-Qiyamah that I have established the hujjah against Fulan. I've done the job of conveying Islam. Who knows that? How do we know that? One may think that one has conveyed Islam, but in essence, the person failed in conveying Islam, either because of his misinformation, or because of his lack of preparation, or because he simply did not have the proper way of communicating with this person. It could be even a communication issue. And the person did not understand Islam. This happens very often when we deal with uh, the language issue. From a linguistic point of view, uh, when you're addressing the people, uh, you have to take into consideration their background. Some of the words which we may use, may, they may not be familiar with them. Or they may have a specific meaning in their religion, which is not in ours. Just a quick example, just to, so you can relate to what I'm saying. Holy. You will find that some Muslims, they love the term holy. And so they say holy Quran, fine. We have our own discussion on that. And then they say holy Ramadan, fine. There's another comment on that. I'm not going to waste time on it. Then we say holy prophet. But hold on a second. You're addressing Christians, for example. And in Christianity, there's a holy father, holy son, and holy spirit. And holy means godly. It's divine. So you come and say the holy prophet said and that the holy prophet did. And you could be very much to them saying that we Muslims worship Allah and the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And you, you're giving Tawheed. You think you delivered Tawheed. But you never elaborated on this particular word. And as they say, it backfired. The whole da'wah backfired. So sometimes not being aware of one term can destroy the da'wah effort. Or can mislead the person whom we are inviting. But we want to simplify our lives. I know this can get very complicated. I don't think I need these right now. It can get very complicated. But ultimately, I and yourselves, when you meet X person, you want to make sure that after you leave, you have left a positive impression about Islam. And some authentic, reliable information. Not, well, I think and I feel, some people feel shy. He's a non-Muslim, so I cannot tell him that I as a Muslim don't know something about Islam. So the person may ask many questions and give him just any answer that comes to mind because he doesn't know any better. It's the same thing when someone, when a non-Muslim says to you, Assalamu alaikum, and then you say, Wa alaikum. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that do not return the salam. You just say, Wa alaikum. Now you know that he doesn't know this. So you say, Wa alaikum, with a peace of mind that he doesn't know that I only said, Wa alaikum, and I, I did not say, Wa alaikum salam, because he's not a Muslim. This kind of thing. But we have to be very careful because the da'wah is at stake. And um, as representatives of the da'wah, as people whom Allah has honored and placed the responsibility on to convey the message, we have to get close to perfection. Perfection is impossible. al kamalu lillah azza wa jal. Perfection belongs to Allah. As for us, we should saddidu wa qaribu. Aim, aim as well as you can and get as close to the target as you could. That's what it means. You know, do the job and then try to get as close as possible to perfection. Why? So we can say we have done our job with ihsan. We have conveyed the message of Islam with ihsan. And therefore, before Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, we're free of the responsibility of not doing a job because we were assigned for this task. And in front of the person, we could say, we, did, we told you about Islam, you chose however not to accept it. 
which is not our responsibility. You will not be able to guide those whom you love. You, no matter what you do, no matter how effective your speech is, how skillful you are, how much information you have, if Allah does not want to do, can't do anything about it. Subhanallah. Otherwise, you would think the first person to become a Muslim would be Abu Talib. Because of his effective, strategic role in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Had he been a Muslim, that would have changed things completely even from early on, before Hijrah, before so many things would have been different. He supported him without his Islam, let alone had he become Muslim. But it's the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. So there we don't get involved and we don't despair. So first things first. Well, first things first is we have two extremes people, kinds of people in da'wah. Those who, as soon as they're faced with a problem, withdraw. And those who go the extra mile, even though it is not required of them to go the extra mile. They speak about things which should not be presented before a non-Muslim at that particular stage. Not everything should be mentioned. Many people, for example, you want to give someone a gift, they bring a non-Muslim. And they say, give him the Qur'an as a gift. It sounds like a good idea, right? No. And don't, don't be upset. If you do this, I'm, not, I'm telling you this, my opinion. You, we, we're each entitled to our own opinions. But I'll tell you my point of view. When the Prophet ﷺ invited the rulers of his time, specifically the Christians, a lot of the Qur'an had been revealed at that time. However, he would send to them one ayah. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ فَأَنْ تَوَلَّ فَقُولُ شَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ This is the only ayah he revealed. The only ayah he sent to them. Because you may give a Quran to a non-Muslim and he opens Surah Al-Anfal or Surah Al-Tawbah or Surah Al-Imran or Surah Al-Nisa, one of these surahs which have military ayat and he's been brainwashed on CNN and Fox News and all this about terrorism, terrorism, terrorism and then he reads, kill them wherever you find them and it's done. And he may never tell you that I read this in your book and this, this and that. Or he may tell you and you don't know how to answer. Done. The da'wah has been damaged. So instead, give him a book relevant to his understanding. What does he have as an issue? Address the issue. Misconceptions about Islam, it's, a, it's an endless road. You, no matter what you do, they will bring another one. Why can you marry four wives? How come a Muslim man can have four wives? Why does the woman have to cover up? How come a man can have relations with his mulkul yameen? I'm, I'm going to give you some tough ones. huh? Mulkul yameen, what, why? She's not his wife. How come? What are you going to say about that? How come you, know, you have warfare in Islam? And why do you fight in the cause of Allah? And what is the reasons behind all of that? Ouch. Again, most of us don't know how to answer any of these. Why do you chop off the arm of the thief? And why do you execute the killer? And why do you stone the adulteress and the adulterer? And the list goes on and on and on. And you could sit like this and say, Can I go? I need some coffee. And you just run away because you can't deal with it. Can't deal with it. But this is the problem. Brother or sister, you don't have to deal with it. It's not your responsibility to deal with it. If you do, Jazakallahu khairan. You have went the extra mile. You have become, you know, specialized in this. Therefore, you, as opposed to someone else, should speak about this matter, not anybody else. But this is not everyone's minimum requirement to give da'wah. The minimum requirement to give da'wah is what we will be discussing in whatever time I have available, inshallah. Which is first thing first. But I'm not going to base it on my opinion. I'm going to base it obviously on the Qur'an and the sunnah. Strictly. And we will see what we learn from the lessons of the Quran and the Sunnah, how the messengers in general, including the Prophet وسلم, and the messenger himself وسلم, in the Sunnah, how he integrated this concept of first thing first into the da'wah. So we'll begin, for example, 
with a fact. We have to put a foundation before we give the actual examples. The foundation is an ayah which we have to know. We have to know. Dealing with a fact that almost everyone denies from among the non-Muslims. The only people who will admit to it is Muslims and even ourselves, we don't remember this occasion. Does anyone know what I'm speaking about? Just to tease you a little bit. Does anyone know what I'm speaking about? Something which every non-Muslim will deny and only Muslims believe in because it's in the Quran. However, we don't rec recollect, we don't recall, we don't remember this event ever taking place in our lives. I'm sorry? Who knows the ayah? Yes, sir. La. Yes, brother. MashaAllah alayk. Let's, let, I'll give you the ayah. Well, I'll give you the ahsant. This ayah we have to know because it's a foundation. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ عَفَوْ زَاكَ اللَّهِ خَيْرَ وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمْ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ I have it here, don't worry. وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا أَن تَقُولُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا but just take the time to read the tafsir of Ibn Kathir in Arabic or English and read the narrations that are relevant to this. The summary of which is Allah Azza wa Jal pulled out all of the children, I didn't translate the ayah, and mentioned when your Lord took from the children of Adam, from their backs, from their loins, their descendants, and He made them testify, am I not your Lord? They said, yes, we testify. Lest you say on the day of recompense, we were about this unaware. Lest you claim that we did not know about Yawm Al-Qiyamah, we did not know about Jannah and Nar, we did not know about Kufr and Tawheed. No excuse. Because you bore witness that Allah Azza wa Jal is, Alastu bi Rabbikum, qalu bala shahidna. So the hadith explains that Allah Azza wa Jal actually made all of the children of Adam testify that Allah is their Lord. So you read another ayah, then you will understand that this is the disposition of Allah which He created the people upon. Then you understand it with the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is Sahih. Every newborn baby is born upon the fitra. Then it is his parents who will either make him a Jew or a Christian or a Magian, a fire worshipper. And it doesn't have to be these three. The scholars say it could be other, if someone said, oh yeah, well, my mom and dad weren't alive. I was raised by my grandfather and grandmother, or by my uncle and aunt. It doesn't matter. The hadith is giving the most common uh, occurrence of things, but it means the environment. The environment will influence what you believe. And so, this is the foundation. Our job is to remind the people what Allah made them testify about before they were created in this life. So no one can come and say, I don't know Tawheed from among the people you're inviting. And no Muslim can say, I don't know Tawheed to invite. Because how are you a Muslim if you yourself don't know Tawheed? This is the, this is the crux of the whole issue. Our obligation is to convey to them this very fact. And if you can memorize Surah Al-Ikhlas, with the translation of the meanings and the tafsir of the surah, then this surah alone is sufficient to refute every Hindu, every Buddhist, every Christian, every atheist, every non-Muslim on earth. This is only Surah Al-Ikhlas, let alone Ayat Al-Kursi, and let alone the end of Surah Al-Hashr, and let alone the other surah where, which would signify and magnify the names and attributes of Allah. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ This every messenger was sent with this very mission. Not answering misconceptions necessarily, even though they did that. But the main mission was worship Allah alone, avoid false worship, avoid false gods. 
And the ayat are many. I'm not going to quote them. Alhamdulillah, insha'Allah ta'ala, all of you are aware of them. The ayat about tawheed and the essence of tawheed and how every messenger was sent with tawheed. So ya akhwan and akhawat, our job is very simple. When you see a non-Muslim, you're seeing your dessert. After having eaten some rice and chicken, and now you're, you feel like having some cheesecake or strawberry. I'm giving the wrong examples. Maybe you're hungry now, so you're going to start imagining food. Okay, stop, stop imagining food. Okay, but just quickly. It's what you're looking for. This person could be your key to Jannah. This could be, you don't know. All of your qiyam, jazakallahu khayran, and all of your siyam, mumtaz, and all of the ibad, ibadat, umrah every other month, ma fi mushkila, beautiful. But we all know, in Islam, no one gets a receipt after he does an ibadah that congratulations, your ibadah has been accepted. Allahu a'lam. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ Raji'oon, those who put forth the best of deeds, of their deeds, while their hearts are trembling, that they are returning to their Lord. Aisha radiallahu anha said to the Messenger of Allah alayhi sallam, Ya Rasulullah, is this the fornicator, the alcoholic, the thief, who, who does sins and then he does good deeds? He said, La ya bintu Siddiq, no O daughter of the Siddiq. This is the person who prays and he gives sadaqah and he fasts, but he does not know whether Allah accepted his ibadah. So we have no guarantee. Therefore, no matter what we're doing as nawafil, good. But we cannot rely upon them. However, the best investment is in an naf'il muta'addi. The benefit which supersedes you to the others. And when I was in Medina just yesterday, we invited a talib ilm from the jami'ah to give a talk to the brothers. And he did something I've never seen before. And I realized that I've been missing out you always learn from people. You always learn from people and you realize that you don't know anything until you see someone else. I realize that I've been missing out on a lot of good deeds uh, which I've never even thought of. This brother, his talk was very short. He said, look, there's a dua from the Prophet ﷺ. He used to say every day after Fajr. Allahumma an yas'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan tayyiban wa amalan mutakabbalan. And he said, I'm not going to leave this gathering until each one of you memorizes it. And he repeated it like 15, 20 times until everyone in the gathering memorized it. He said, then you promise me that you will teach this to one person in your family. And then that one person will teach it to someone else. He said, inshallah, I will see this ba'den. I will see it afterwards. Very practical, straight to the point. Gave him the hadith, explained it in a short time. And he did the job. And I'm assuming, inshallah, wallahu alam, the next morning, Allah knows how many people actually repeated this dua with the benefit. So this is the kind of investment that you're looking for. When you do something for someone, then they do it, they teach it to others. This is all in your book of deeds, your hasanat. Let alone a non-Muslim becoming a Muslim. So he has salawat five times a day, and the dhikr and the Quran, and, and then he may invite his family members. All of this is in your book of deeds. And all it takes is knowing the first things first. Prioritizing and learning Tawheed. Yusuf alayhi salam. Did Yusuf apply this methodology in his da'wah or not? Did, does anyone remember the ayat? What happened? What happened? Now here, just to translate for those who don't know Arabic. He entered the prison along with two young men, Shabab. And one of them told them, I see that I have that, you know, I'm squeezing wine over my head. And the other one said, I see that there's, I see myself squeezing wine. And the other one said, I see that there's bread over my head. The birds are eating from this bread. So explain, interpret this dream for us. We see you among those who are doing good. Those who are excelling in life. He said, no food will come to you except that I would, I would have already explained to you this dream before the food comes to you. This was now people seeking fatwa. And he saw an opportunity. 
Their need is ta'wil of hilm. Something basic, he could do it and move on with his life. The first thing he did, he said, ذَلِكُمَا مِمَّا عَلَّمَنِي Rabbi. Now, pay attention now. Whatever I'm about to tell you is not because I'm Yusuf and I'm special. It's because of what my Lord has taught me. So he referred the matter to Allah Azza wa Jal مُبَشَرَةً إِنِّي تَرَكْتُ مِلَّةَ قَوْمٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ then he explained further. This is because, not because also just like that, I actually had to do something. I abandoned a group of people who don't believe in Allah and in the life to come they are disbelievers. And I followed the footsteps of my forefathers. This is the praiseworthy. Because Allah also blamed people for saying, Inna wajadna abana ala ummah. Uh, we find our forefathers like this. It's not always good unless they are upon salah and iman. ذلك ما كان لنا أن نشرك بالله من شيء. It was never ever. If you use just if you analyze the Arabic usage, the words Allah chose, it was never for any one of us ever to associate anything with Allah ever. This is from the bounty of Allah upon us and upon the people, but most people are not thankful. Listen now. Ya sahibay sijin, a arbabun mutafarrikun a khayrun, amillahu al wahidu al qahar. Subhanallah. He gave it to them right in their face. No beating around the bush, as they say, and trying to be diplomatic and political, none of that. Right after he gave them the introduction about his background history, all companions of the prison. Are too many gods better or one? who is the prevailing, the irresistible. Da'wah to Tawheed, straight up. Then he also showed them the deficiency in what they're doing. Because sometimes you're the contender or the one you're, you're giving the encounter, you're giving da'wah to, he has a strong foundation. And he believes that whatever you're saying is not sufficient. So sometimes you have to shake his foundation to realize that he doesn't have the stability. مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِهِ إِلَّا أَسْمَاءً سَمَّيْتُمُوهَا أَنْتُمْ وَأَبَاؤُكُمْ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِن سُلْطَانٍ You are worshipping nothing but names. They are not really gods. You and your forefathers have named. Allah did not send down any authority concerning them. صح? Then what did he say? مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِن سُلْطَانٍ إِنِ الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ The command belongs only to Allah. أَمَرَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا he commanded that you worship none but him. This is the upright religion. So what did Yusuf do? He saw an opportunity to invite these people and instead of dealing with the trivial secondary issues like their dream interpretation, he first began with Tawheed. And this is the same job we have to do. There's a hadith which many of you may have not heard before. The hadith was collected by Ibn Majah, Al-Hakim and Al-Dhahabi, and they both said it's Sahih, and Al-Nasai and Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi. It's a Sahih hadith. This is the hadith of Jabir ibn Sulaym, radiyallahu anhu wa arda. He said, رَأَيْتُ, رأيت رَجُلًا يَصْدُرُ النَّاسُ عَنْ قَوْلِهِ لَا يَقُولُ شَيًّا إِلَّا صَدَرُ عَنْهِ I saw a man, people carrying out everything he says. He would not say anything except that the people will carry it out. قُلْتُ مَنْ هَذَا I said, who is this? قَالُوا هَذَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ They said, this is the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. قَالَ قُلْتُ عَلَيْكَ السَّلَامِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَرَّتَيْنِ He said, I said to him, upon you be peace twice. قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَا تَقُلْ عَلَيْكَ السَّلَامِ فَأَنَّ عَلَيْكَ السَّلَامِ تَحِيَّةُ الْمَيِّ this is the salutation of the deceased. Say, Assalamu alaikum. Qultu anta Rasulullah. Qala ana Rasulullah. Now, now pay attention here. Pay attention to what will come. And I just want to show you the, the cohesiveness and the correlation between the Yusuf approach alayhi salam and the approach of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam. Notice that Yusuf automatically spoke about Allah azza wa jal. Thalikuma mimma allamani rabbi. Look what he said. قَالَ أَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ الَّذِي إِذَا أَصَابَقَ ضَرٌ فَدَعَوْتَهُ كَشَفَهُ عَنْكَ He did not say, I'm the messenger of Allah. Then he say, Allah again. He linked them. أَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ الَّذِي Meaning Allah Azza wa Jal. 
if a calamity befalls you, you supplicate to him, he will alleviate it. وَإِذَا أَصَابَكَ عَامُ سَنَةٍ فَدْعَوْتَهُ أَنْبَتَهَا لَكَ And if you have a year of drought, you supplicate to him, he will make the vegetation grow. وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِي أَرْضِ فَلَاتٍ فَضَلَّتْ عَنْكَ رَاحِلَتُكَ فَدْعَوْتَهُ رَدَّهَا عَلَيْكَ And if you were, بارك الله فيك, شكراً أخي العزيز. And if you were, if you were in a vast desert, and your cattle, the animal you're using to ride, escaped and ran away, you make dua for him, he will bring it back. Now, this went straight into the heart of Jabir ibn Sulaym, straight into his heart, because it was alatul about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first thing first. What was the very next thing he said? I'ahad ilay. Advise me, give me a covenant by which I will adhere and, and apply my life. He said, never ever verbally abuse anyone. Look what the Sahabi said. The Sahabi, After that, advice of the Prophet والسلام, I never verbally abused not a free person, nor a slave person, nor a sheep, or even a camel, not even an animal. Tell this those who are driving nowadays and cursing everybody else on the street. This is the immediate response of the Sahabi. And he said then afterwards, وَلَا تَحْقِرَنَّ مِنَ الْمَعْرُوفِ شَيْئًا And never belittle any good deed. وَأَن تُكَلِّمَ أَخَاكَ وَأَن تَمُنْبَسِطٌ إِلَيْهِ وَجُكْ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنَ الْمَعْرُوفِ even if you were to speak to your brother while you have a smile on your face, this is part of good deed. Then he told him, alayhi salatu salam, وَرْفَعْ إِزَارَكَ إِلَى نِصْفِ السَّاقِ And raise your garment to halfway up your leg. فَإِنْ أَبَيْتَ فَإِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ But if you refuse, then make sure that it is above the ankles. وَإِيَّاكَ وَإِسْبَالِ الْإِزَارِ And woe to you from dragging your garment beneath your ankles. فَإِنَّهَا مِنَ الْمَخِيلَةِ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمَخِيلَةِ Because it is part of arrogance and Allah does not love arrogance. And then he said, وَإِنْ إِمْرُؤٌ عَيَّرَكَ أَوْ شَتَمَكَ بِمَا يَعْلَمُ فِيكَ فَلَا تُعَيِّرْهُ بِمَا تَعْلَمُ فِيهِ فَإِنَّمَا وَبَالُ ذَلِكَ عَلَيْهِ And if a person criticized you because of some defect you have, he knows about you, don't go do the same to him because the sin, the, the outcome of the sin will fall on him. Don't retaliate. You know, إدفع بالتي هي أحسن. Respond with that which is best. So this particular hadith has many lessons. The one we want to elaborate and focus on is how the Prophet ﷺ effectively gave people da'wah to tawheed first. And then afterwards he spoke about other matters, including garment. Some may say, think this is too early to tell him about where the garment should be. La. The Messenger of Allah والسلام, would evaluate the people he's inviting. And he will give them the right advice at the right time to the right person in the perfect manner. And a person who's involved in da'wah must have the same skill. It's a skill which is God-given. It's, it's a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal, Jibiliya. And it's something which you can actually grow. It's something you can work on. So the more you give da'wah, the more you know when to speak, when not to speak, when to comment, when not to comment. You, you learn this as you go along. But you will only learn if you're involved in the field. Not if you're a spectator. If you're watching other people do it, then you will not learn anything yourself. So from this particular hadith, we learn from the Prophet ﷺ that we have to put the tawheed first. So the question which remains, and I want someone, I'm sorry, I want someone to answer me. You're on an airplane. You're on an airplane. And it's a 45 minute flight. And next to you is a non-Muslim. How do you give him da'wah? How do you begin the conversation. The person is minding his business. He doesn't really want to be social with you. Especially maybe he sees that you look like a Muslim. So he's, he's intimidated by your appearance. How do you begin this conversation in an effective way? Anyone? I'm sorry, Akhi? Introduction? You're going to stand in the airplane? Say, allow me to introduce myself. Huh? How are you going to do it? Introduction, that's a very broad term. Specify.
Okay. Beautiful. Can we vote for the brother's opinion? How many are with him? Yeah? Those who are not with you, you can deal with them outside after the lecture. Huh? <laughs> Remember them. I'm with him. One, of the, one practical way is just to make the person reflect on facts. So have, you, have you ever thought that we're flying? You know, it, this is wild. We're, very, we're high, high above the ground in this aircraft going I don't know at what speed, and we're sitting here drinking orange juice. Isn't that amazing? And the, the normal person, I mean, you meet some really annoying people that nothing excites them. Huh? This one, khali wali as they say. But the, the, the average person will, will react, say yeah. So you say, who do you think, you know, what, how does a human being do all this? And from there, you will lead him. You're leading him until you make him speak about the creator of this creation. If the creation came up with these amazing things, then what about the creator himself? That's a practical way. The sister had an, a, an opinion which, which was interrupted. Would you like to express it? Yes? Hmm. Okay, she has an observation, but I have my comments. She said that she can say that, you know, who's protecting us right now? She will make the person think, how are we being protected? And then you can explain to them that only Allah can protect. But let's be honest. What if Allah decreed that this airplane crashes? You, we just said that, we, you said to the person, Allah is the one who protects. So when you say this to a non-Muslim, his mind, in his mind, he doesn't understand what we believe in regards to Qadr and that, that you know Allah's wisdom is that a believer he may take him because he wants to give him Jannah early on. This is a lengthy discussion. If the airplane, they start some turbulence and start shaking and they say, hey, hey what happened to the protection? And then you feel yourself going down. What are you gonna, the last thing you're going to say is, um, sorry, wrong example. Okay. Close the window. Mm. Okay. Now, okay, but you, I maybe you misunderstood what, what I was trying to say. I, I wasn't against the, the idea. I'm just saying hypothetically, if something happened, what would be the uh, counter plan? If something were to happen, you need to have an answer prepared for if Allah decreed that something will happen to the airplane. Not against the concept. The concept of uh, letting the people know that it's all in the hands of Allah. Uh, we all agree on these principles. Don't misunderstand what I was saying. But I'm trying to be factual. Factually speaking, sometimes certain examples, even though they make sense in, in from one angle, they may have some loopholes in, from other angles. And therefore, they provide the non-Muslim the opportunity to misunderstand what you're saying, and the whole thing may backfire. So that example, if not put in the right context, may backfire. Specifically, if something winds up happening on the, on the airplane, where the person will then question the concept of protection in Islam which is a lengthy conversation. Any other opinions?
Yes, brother. Uh, well, تفضل. Okay. Beautiful. Yes, Sheikh. Making diagonal deep is like building a house. You can't build a house without a foundation. Hmm. Some of the questions that people ask are offensive to non-Muslims and they're offensive to non-Arabs. You first have to find out about him. Where do you work? Well, basically, you you led me towards what I was waiting for. I've been I've been waiting to get all the feedback, uh, which could be very much effective and are effective. But then there's always the missing link, and the missing link is uh, the connection with this person. Sometimes we don't have a connection with this person, and without the connection, you can come up with many funny examples or many things to say which will be, you know, will be basically disregarded with cold-bloodedness. person will just look at you and say, please don't talk to me again. It happens. Please don't talk to me again. I don't like religion. I don't like religion. I'm not interested in this talk. I don't believe in God. I don't want to believe in God. It's your own business. Just leave me alone. Now, how would you feel for the rest of the flight? It's not a very happy feeling. Therefore, one of the critical issues that we have to do when in, and I was hoping someone will say that, and the Sheikh, mashallah, picked it up early on. When you get on that airplane, you first have to create some chemistry with that person. And that is very easy. You're sitting next to Fulan, X person, and then what is one thing you can do to create some conversation, healthy conversation? The seat belt. The seat, honestly, you get him the seat belt. Get him, get yours, and say, that's all it takes. And the natural reaction is, thank you. Thank you very much, that's nice of you. And khalas, you entered. When the, the stewardess, hopefully it's a male, stops by to give you the juice, so you say, no, what do you want first? Or if you order the same thing, you give him first. Say, would you like an extra napkin? They give you each a tissue. One for you, one for him. Say, would you like mine? Do you need extra ones? Little things like that, it's all it takes. It doesn't take uh, that you give him a thousand riyals in his pocket. Say, listen, a thousand riyals, just accept what I'm going to tell you in the next half an hour. Barakallah feek. You know, take it. It's not going to happen. Little things, very tiny little things. When you both entering the plane, you let him go first. He's unable to close the, uh, the latch on the, the thing where the luggage is. You close it on his behalf. Small things like that will take you a long way. Now once he has received you, then you can give any example. Any example, if the, if the mood is right, and you have some foundation obviously, then inshallah you'll be able to take that person to where you be. Well, where's the final destination though? Not where you're gonna land. The final destination is that you want to at least have spoken to him about Tawheed in one way or another. It may not be that you begin with it. When we say first thing first, it doesn't mean that you say, okay, the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is in Islam is Tawheed. Tawheed is of three categories. Tawheed Rububiyya, Tawheed Luluhiyya, Tawheed Asma al Sifat. That's not, that's not effective. To him, this is gibberish. Doesn't make any sense. You don't have to use the term Tawheed, nor do you have to begin with it. 
you can allude to different things and make that lead to the concept of the Creator, the greatness of the Creator, the majesty of the Creator. The misconceptions which you will often get when he will, now the person becomes defensive and he feels that you are superior to him in regards to your belief in, 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 in Allah. And he feels that his belief in his God, because he doesn't know who his God is really, is shaken. So he may retaliate with a misconception. He may tell you, okay, you know what, allow me. I know since you're being upfront and frank with me, there's something that's been on my mind for a while. How come, uh, you know, Muslim men are allowed to marry for women, for example? Now we want to hear more examples, without anyone getting upset at me. Uh, how would you retaliate? How would you answer that one? He suddenly out of nowhere tells you about the four wives. Now don't explain it to me. If you have a good answer, and there are plenty of good answers, believe me, there are answers that are so good, it will make this person want to become a Muslim to take a second wife. Not the sister's favorite example. But anyways, it has happened before. It could be really good. It's very convincing. The, the explanation of the concept of uh, polygyny, because we have polygamy, that is a man having more than one wife or a wife having more than one husband, and polygyny, spelled differently, pronounced differently, is strictly a man having more than one wife. This is a little technical, but, but it's relevant to our discussion. It could be very convincing if you explain it properly, but I don't need an explanation. You don't know. We are assuming you don't know. How will you get yourself out of this trap and then go back to your initial discussion about conveying to him who Allah is. Let's give a, a few, uh, those who didn't raise their hands a chance and then those who have raised their hands can ask again. Sisters, of course, feel free to speak uh, automatically. You have the privilege of ladies first. Huh. Oof. We're trapped, huh? We only have... You said 15? Yeah, yani roughly 7 minutes, ya akhwan. Or we can or we can convert to Q&A right now. I don't want to ruin your initial schedule. We have 20 though. We should have 20. Oh, mashallah. So? Yes, akhi, tfaddal. Wait, is, is your wife here? <laughs> that's, maybe, that's the answer that they usually give when the wife is here. When she's not, he'll tell you something else. Maybe Mushkila, go ahead. Okay. But you're giving me an answer. I don't want an answer. We're assuming that you don't know anything. You're trapped. You really got trapped with this question. Let me give you a more difficult one. He says, why are Muslim men allowed to have relations with their slave women? Mulkul Yameen. The right hand belonging. Possession. Why is that allowed? Now that one you don't know. Sah? Taib. Now get out of the, the trouble. I would say that uh, <laughs> everyone calculate the uh, numbers. Women are more than uh, men. Yes, yeah, Sheikh. Sure. You're still answering the first one. I will answer the first one. La, la, we're assuming that you don't know. Skip. How huh? I skip? Or just say, when are we landing? Aren't we supposed to be arriving there already? Khalas. You won't be able to revive it because he killed it for you. Pay attention. Some of them know what they're talking about. They do their research. They've, they've read on Islam. They know where to catch you. And he knows when to put an end to your discussion. And we're trying to be fortified. We want to be ever ready. Anytime they try to put us down, we will come up again and continue, of course, with, a, with manners, with mannerism and kindness. I'm not saying that you will force him to have a conversation. But if he's trying to shut you down with an example or a misconception, he knows you can answer. I want you to, you know, like boxing. Boxing is not halal. But just like boxing, you want to kind of, you know, duck and then move on, not get knocked out. So I would say that, uh, okay, let me ask you a different question. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, now that. <laughs> so you'll just, in his face, tell him, I, I'm going to deal with something else. Okay, good. Jazakallah khair. Frank and honest. And it could work. It could work. But can we think of something more effective? You don't know. Okay. Yes, the sunnah answer is the best. I don't know. Uh. 
but tell him that you're going to take his phone number and find the answer for him. Perfect. You, look, the problem in very often, you meet someone on the airplane, trust me, they don't want to give you their contact information. They don't. You're, you're anonymous. You're a stranger. People don't go out given unless he's a big mudir in a company and those are the ones who love to distribute their cards all over the time, yeah? All, to all over the people, all over the people. But assuming that this is not the case, people are not going to give you his personal email, personal phone number off the bat. So when you do this, you have created a window of hope for future communication and you got out with no trouble. You know what? That's a good question. And I will get you a good answer for it, inshallah. Insha'Allah, by the way, means if Allah wills. And you go discuss if Allah wills and he's lost. You understand how you trapped him? You say, I will give you an answer, insha'Allah. By the way, because I'm sorry for speaking Arabic all the time. Insha'Allah means if Allah wills. Because we believe that everything is in the will of Allah. I met you in, by the will of Allah. And we will separate by the will of Allah. And, we will, and then you take him on a whole other road and he gets lost. You got the contact and later on you can find a decent answer from one of these scholars or the dua to so on and so forth and email it to this person and there you go. You've had a successful da'wah uh, mission. Anything else? Zakallah khairan. Anything else? Or we'll convert to Q&A session. Let's just convert to the Q&A session. I ask questions and, and you give the answers. Barakallah fikum. Yes, brother. This is the method of choice which brings a non Muslim closer to Islam and frequently he prepares that what should his have to begin the conversation. It's true that at most work places and educational institutes, it is considered a taboo to talk about religion and politics, however, a sharp and dedicated Muslim Dawa work will find an excuse to start talking about Islam, for example. Muslims are frequently in the news because there are problems in the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and India, or other parts of the Muslim world. One can ask a question to colleagues or to fellow students or Americans about the news involving Muslims and its background turn and replay around and ask the person if he, she know anything about Muslims or Islam, depending upon the situation, continue the discussion uh, or promise some scripture. Don't get any yourself on the spot. If you expect to see the person again soon because it may look the spot, uh, it may look like Mm. If it is wrong, schedule. I, I, I'm sorry. Is, is this a, a question or I, I missed I missed what's going on? Okay, it's further now. For example, okay. set up. If it was a casual encounter, like a fellow traveler get a torture in metro. Cities in the, US, uh, in the United States. <laughs> Many Muslim taxi drivers get Islam, Islamic brochure uh, with them, and if the situation allows, they hand over one or two brochures as a messenger, uh, as a messenger to send back. This is a personal approach, one to one. No. Okay, thank you. Barakallah fiqh. Zakallah khairan. So questions? Yes, Akhi. I think you need the microphone. I can see it from this question by asking him another question. Is it, uh, which is better for you, as uh, who is asking me, uh, to know your wife, one, two, or three, or four wives, or you don't know? Uh, anyway, you don't know who uh, is it your uh, daughter or not, your son or not. Mm. Uh, and also uh, ask you, which is better for the uh, all over the world now uh, to know the, the uh, relation between the uh, family or not? Mm. And also, what about the diseases by AIDS? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, AIDS, AIDS. 
Na, na. Inshallah. Sisters, do you have any questions? Oh, how to actually answer the question? إلا على أزواجهم أو مملكة أيمانهم. No, 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 sister. The ayah barak Allah fiki. The ayah in in which you refer to is the one where Allah Azza wa Jal allowed the Muslim man to marry the Mamluka, and so then it's advised that he marries a a hurra, a woman who's free, who's a own, you know, not a not a slave woman. Unless they have some excuses. As for having relations with the slave woman, then this is allowed, period. It's allowed across the board from the time she becomes his property after the warfare. He doesn't have to be in need, nor is it an exception to the rule, nor is it something that Allah allowed. This is uh, for only that person or for particular needs. It's allowed all across the board. There's an answer. I mean, if, if we go, if we if we wanted to deal with misconceptions, then we could deal with misconceptions, and they are they are very valid answers for everyone. Never be scared. The point. So here, but if he doesn't release her, she still he has the right to enjoy her for as long as he wants. 
if they have children. They may not have children. The, the point that I'm trying to say is, the point that I'm trying to say, is when we deal with misconceptions, uh, we, some of us tend to worry because we don't know, uh, an, an ad, we don't have an adequate answer for the non-Muslim. And the point which I want to deliver, uh, because I cannot speak about the misconceptions, we can, each of us, I'm sure each one here can give us more examples about uh, the wisdom behind having four wives or the wisdom behind having relations, excuse me, with the slave woman, but I don't think time will allow us to discuss that. What I do want you to know is that never ever think that there's anything which doesn't have an answer. And understand the second principle. Don't think no matter what they ask you, if you do the research, if you do your homework, you will provide satisfactory answers. But time out. Satisfactory answers to who? To someone who wants to be satisfied with your answer. What, you, what we need to understand is when you're trying to explain a misconception to a non-Muslim and he's not satisfied with it, remember that this person is not even satisfied with Allah himself, let alone to be satisfied with your explanation. So don't panic. If he continues to argue, every time you explain, but, but remember, this person, Allah is not good enough for him, billah. Allah himself is not good enough for him to worship him. Do you think our explanation or the revelation of Allah or the hukum of Allah is sufficient? No, it is not. If Allah himself is not convincing, then Allah's deen is not convincing to him either. So you will reach a point with some people where there's nothing else you can say. Because they don't want to accept the truth. Our job is to know that this person, Allah does not have it meant for them to be guided at this point. Because they have not accepted Allah as their Lord and as their master. Therefore there's a كَلَّا بَلْ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ It has veiled their hearts what they used to earn. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا those whom Allah does not give any light, they will have no light. Not the vision that goes blind, but the hearts. Hearts with which they don't understand, eyes with which they do not see, ears with which they do not hear. They are like the animals, they are even more astray. So Allah already told us there's this kind of people that nothing will work with them. It's not our job to change them. It's our job, however, to convey Tawheed. And the second level, you know, like Martabat al-Ihsan in Da'wah, we have Islam in Iman and Ihsan. Martabat al-Ihsan is that we all equip ourselves with the proper answers for these misconceptions. If you're interested, I have a lecture on YouTube titled breaking the barriers breaking the barriers and that lecture deals with each one of these misconceptions and inshallah ta'ala bi tawfiq allah it it attacks it heads on it gives a proper strong answer not my own invention based on research opinions of other du'at other scholars it's a compilation of many convincing uh, you know elements put together in one to save you the headache so that we will not have to twist something about islam to make it agreeable to the non-Muslim. No, we'll say it as it is. Say yes, fighting is allowed in Islam. Yes, it's part of our deen. But let me explain to you the guidelines of fighting. First, are you a Christian? Yes. Have you read the Bible? No. Well, let me quote to you some of the biblical verses which refer to fighting. Specifically Jesus. Like in Luke, where Jesus was described as coming on a horse, blood spilling, and he would want to divide and separate between the father and the son. And you can quote some biblical verses that the Christians didn't even know existed in the Bible. And then you can give them a logical explanation. Every country has weaponry. They have a military. Why? They say for defense. Islam is a country. It's a nation. And we have... Defense, it's the same thing. We're not doing anything that, no, that anybody else is, is not doing. We're doing everything the same. I'm just giving you an example. Every one of them, there's an answer for it. So, but you just have to take some time, inshallah, to, to get familiar with them and you'll be able to give da'wah, inshallah, ta'ala, effectively. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I've been waiting for the... I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that we're doing already q &A. The sister was asking actually a question, but I interrupted her.
How short is it, Akhi? Two words? Tfaddal, tfaddal. Thank you very much. It's a short question. You're welcome. Yes, brother. Uh, how can Muslims survive severe retardation and defeat this enmity and hatred to Islam by both the East and the West? And what's the secret behind this eternal hatred? Though God promises, وَلَمْ يَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ سَبِيلًا. Thank you. No. The ayah, barakallah feek, is referring to Allah Azza wa Jal given the superiority and edge for the disbelievers over the believers. It's not speaking about the condition of the heart. Regarding the condition of a heart, you have to look at another ayah. وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ That is the one you think of when you see why are we at odds with each other. Why is this this confrontation? Because they will never be pleased with us until we become Jews or Christians or Hindus, Buddhists, and so on and so forth. You, you see what I'm saying? So this is where, so this is the, the hikmah of Allah. That there will be khair and sharr. When ablukum bishari wal khairi fitna. It's a test of Allah. It's meant to be this way. Al haq dud al batil. So that Allah Azza wa Jal will make the haq eliminate and eradicate the batil. But Allah Azza wa Jal will allow the batil to have some success, some minor success in a limited area when the people of haq are not doing their job which is what Muslims are going through today. Not that we are inferior in numbers or intelligence or manpower or fulus or what, whatever you want it. We are actually superior almost on all fronts. But we are divided and we don't really practice Islam the way we're supposed to practice it. The Sahaba had the opposite manhaj and therefore they were successful. Uh, where, where It's okay. Thank you again for your beautiful session. Zakallah khair. Well, you're welcome. That uh, the way you explain Roman. Zakallah khair. What do you say that every man is a for his communication? Even though we know that the Bible says we should, of course, we have the Prophet, Quran, and Sunnah, and the Sunnah for those who follow Allah. Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're very welcome. So she's asking that more time is given for this. Inshallah ta'ala. I personally don't mind if you decide eventually that we have a workshop on misconceptions where we can take them one by one and, and just go through it completely until the last bit and make sure that each and every one of us has understood the nature of this misconception and how to address it. Khair inshallah. It's, it's no issues. Now we conclude with Zakumullah khair. I hope I didn't make anyone upset. Um, and if I did, I apologize. And uh, I appreciate your attentiveness and your, you taking the time to, to come here. And I wish that all of us will be successful in our endeavors. And ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept our deeds and make him sincere for his sake. And to make us among his righteous slaves. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad. Jazakum Allah khair. Assalamu alaikum.